I've called today Homegrown, Shaping Lifelong Faith is sort of the subtitle, and I'm going to explain to you why that is and where it came from, um, and it's a bit of an initiative that sort of started in Sydney. I just want to let you know this is why I do what I do. Jesus took ministry to children very seriously, and I love the fact that in Scripture, straight up, he makes a point of ministering to kids himself, not telling other people that it's important and how it should be done and make time for them, but he himself went out of his way to do it, and um, I praise God for that. Because if he was just telling people that kids are important but wasn't really demonstrating it himself, I think it would really make our jobs even more challenging than they are right now. Jesus was an awesome storyteller. I think a really fun person to be around. And why do I know this? Because kids were drawn to him. And um, they know that he really cared about them. So this is why I do what I do. The other reason I do what I do, and again, that stretch, I don't look quite as overweight as that picture. <laughs> Although some of you are like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Um, that's my family. Um, another reason I do what I do is I'm a dad first and foremost. I'm a pastor, I'm a chaplain, I'm an administrator in Greater Sydney. All of those reasons, I love kids and I want to see all of them in the kingdom. And I want to pause here and tell you something. I want to see my own kids in the kingdom. I don't just want to be ministering to kids, you know, in school or in church or whatever. I want my kids to be in the kingdom. And I want to let you know that is my responsibility. As a parent, and I'm going to be talking pretty directly and pretty challenging and sharing some quotes with you in a minute, but I was really challenged when I first sat down to talk about this. Another way of you getting to know me, I just want you to know that I am not schizophrenic. Um, but one of the ways I like to engage with kids and make the gospel alive and creative, we all do it in our own different ways. One of the ways I like to do it is by telling stories and offer I immerse myself in the characters and the, you know, the, the, um, the costumes that go with that. I need to speak a bit quietly because there's certain kids in the room are all going to go, oh, so you're the, mm -hmm, whatever. But anyway, so I want you to know that um, a little bit about me and that, yes, I love kids and I love being creative. And coming back to the point that was raised before, from a year one teacher, very quickly, we grow out of that all too quickly, and we as adults take life all too seriously, in my opinion. And how do we continue to engage um, kids in their faith journey? So I just thought I'd, I'd um, put that up, and if everyone left going, I can't listen to this guy, he has nothing important or serious to say, I could have said a prayer, and we could have all gone home and gone, done. But you've all stayed despite that, so that's excellent. So I've called this Shaping Lifelong Faith, or Homegrown. Where does this come from? How many of you are familiar with a resource called Think Orange? Excellent. Really good book. I encourage you to read it. In case you're wondering, it looks like that. Think Orange, again, not quite as stretched as the picture. But the idea of Think Orange is this partnership between church and home. This is where they began. They said, you know what? If church is represented with yellow or flame or the Holy Spirit and home is red where the heart is, when you bring these two things together in partnership, you get... Orange. So think orange is how do these two work together to bring out the best in our kids' faith? It's not one or the other, it's both. I really started to think about that, and we were struggling with this in Greater Sydney, and our, our journey on that is the homegrown concept, okay? And that's why I'm going to be speaking uh, to you about it. But interesting, other faith communities are going through the same journey as well. But this is where the think orange thing really got us thinking, and then I thought, what a, what a unique opportunity. It's not just a partnership between church and home, but it's a partnership between church, home, and in, I think in many of our contexts, school. We have a school system that often is very underutilized, in my opinion. So I just wanted to share that with you as well. Here's some quotes that are going to hit hard. So Ellen G. White in um, Adventist Home this is what she says, how sad it is that many parents have cast off their God-given responsibility to their children and are willing that strangers should bear it for them. They are willing that others should labor for their children and relieve them of all burden in the matter. I want to, she continues on and listen what she says here. Parents, you should not leave this work and I want you to see that she's highlighted three areas. It's not the church. In fact, more specifically, it's not just the minister's job to be doing the act of raising your kids to understand spiritual things and their salvation. She goes, you've got awesome Sabbath school teachers, but guess what? You get the vibe of what's going on. I'm not gonna read these quotes word for word. I know all of you can read. 
But what she's saying there is it's not the job of the church alone, it's not the job of the minister who pastors that church alone, and it's not the job of the Sabbath school teacher. Now, all of you are going to me, that sounds like everyone's just trying to get off the hook. And my answer to that is absolutely not. I think all of us should be doing the absolute best with excellence that we can do, but what she's trying to get at comes a little bit later on. Well, hang on, did I just make that go black? Oh, there it is. Then she goes on and she says, you know what, you've got a school. And you can read the quote there. She goes on, you know, who minister the word of God. But she says, parents who leave to the school the work of making Christians of their children will meet with terrible loss. The youth need the righteous influence of their parents in every word and action in their conversation and habits. It's a consistent message in all areas, in all spheres of life. So one of the things I encourage parents to do is it's a partnership. The school is doing the best that they can. The church is gonna do the best that we can. We're not saying it's not our, our job, it's not important, but you need to be doing the best that you can. And so I often challenge parents with this whole idea and this concept. I love what she says here. Fathers and mothers, there's a work for you to do. You have a school established here, but you are not to leave the burden of training your children with the teachers of the school. It is your privilege and duty, and these are the words I want to sink in, to link right up with them by carrying forward this work of Christian education where? Where? In your homes. Okay? I've talked to too many parents of, I pay my school fees and I send them to the Adventist school or a Christian school or any school for that matter. It's their job. Or we pay our tithes, they come to church, we have children's ministries, pastors, church pastors, Sabbath school teachers, they should do their thing. It's really a partnership. That's the word I want you to hear again. It is the home that the education of the child is to begin. Yar is his first school. And then, if you think she's alone in this, yes, Reggie Bar uh, George Barner from um, Raising Spiritual Champions. The home has the greatest impact on young lives with few exceptions. If we fail to impact the home, we will never make a lasting impact on our children. Now, as I said to you, that really sunk deep for me. I'm like, am I really intent on doing what I do as a pastor and as a chaplain and so focused on those roles that I'm actually forgetting that it's my responsibility, my key role as a dad, to make sure that my kids are in the kingdom. It's no one else's fault. It's no one else's, you know, I, I can't blame anyone else for that. And so I just really want that to, to sort of sink in. This is the analogy that I use. I want you to imagine this plant. This is the home, this is the child, and this is the role of church and school. We can do the best that we can to add you know, the most nutritious water and fertilizers and things to help that plant grow, but ultimately, where is that child rooted and established? In the home. And our parents partnering with us in really, really unpacking and, and echoing the things that they're hearing at school and at church, you know, or are they seeing a disconnect between those things? And it, it's challenging, I'm, I'm putting it out there. So there you have the soil, the plant, and the water. So continuing on with that sort of analogy, as I said to you, I see this as a collaboration between home, school, and church. We all have a role to play. We're all about doing the same thing, and that's raising our kids to be lifelong disciples. And so these are just some ideas of what that could look like. So the collaboration, you know, Think Orange, as I said, was home and church, so that's represented in the middle there. But we have great opportunities for home and school to collaborate, and we also have great opportunities for school and churches to collaborate. And I think we need to start having those conversations about what does that look like? What does that mean? What are some of the things? And the thing is, I don't want to be too specific in these because it's going to be different in every context. All right? I, I know it's hard to see. It's doing this little jiggle thing and it's, it's wide, but I hope that the information is still sort of sinking through, if you get that. All right. I've also had a very challenging conversation with my colleagues at the conference office. I've often said to them, it's funny, you're going to, this is a, an example of um, the stewardship department. I said, how often do you go into churches from the conference perspective and you're talking to churches about stewardship? How many times are you talking to the kids in the church about being a steward? You're talking to the adults and we often think departments at church, departments at the conference are there to service the church. And I've had some interesting debates with them. I said, no, I also believe that our departments are there to service the church, 
but also the kids in our church that are not quite members or tithe paying, whatever. And we also have the opportunity to step into school space and talk to kids that would otherwise never hear these messages. And they're like, oh, our department's being responsible to, to, to schools. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. What an awesome opportunity. Imagine going to a school talking about stewardship around all these areas, not just money, my time, my talent, my treasure, my temple. You can serve and honor God in all of these aspects of your life. And I said to them, give me an opportunity to talk to all the principals in Greater Sydney Conference when you come together for half an hour. And I went in and I went in with the stewardship director and I said, we've been talking and praying about this. We would like to come and support you at your school in these messages if you would like us to, but you drive the agenda. If that's one chapel or if that's stuff in your newsletter or whether that's come and speak each, each term on one of these aspects, you let us know, but we're prepared to put our hand up and say we're prepared to support you in this. And I must say to you that the, the response was very positive. I'll be honest with you, not every principal has contacted us and ta- taken us up on the, on the offer. Um, some have, some haven't, some are still in the journey. But as I said, I think if we can model it well in some context and that starts to you know, take root, I think there's great opportunities as it continues to grow. I did the same thing with ADRA. I said, we talk a lot about ADRA and the ADRA appeal and many parents themselves don't want to go door to door. They don't want their kids to go door to door because we're very concerned about their safety and all this stuff. And let's be honest, people don't like us to go door to door. That's my experience. We're very protective of who comes and who leaves what in the letterbox. Society is moving that way. Am I saying that what we do for ADRA is not important door to door? No, absolutely. We should never stop that. But we need to find other ways that we can engage people that are not gifted that way and particularly our children in the ADRA project. So I said to the ADRA department, how can we get kids involved in being really service and mission orientated from when they're little? Because think about it, when you've got them when they're young, you've got them for life. Otherwise, we wait for them to be older and go, oh, these are all really important things that we want to be part of you, but it's already part of their DNA. Now I want to hit you with some stuff. These are the stats that keep me awake at night. And I hope you're ready for them. David um, Sola in his book, Goodbye Generation, despite all the incredible children's, youth and adult programs, we have not been able to stop this mass exodus from our churches. We have not lost one generation. We are losing several. Another book, David Kinnaman from You Lost Me. Like a Geiger counter under the mushroom cloud, the next generation is reacting to the radioactive intensity of social, technological, religious changes And for the most part, we are sending them into the world unprepared to withstand the fallout. Another book, Ken Ham, who's an Australian now living in America, students don't begin doubting in college, they simply depart by college. If you look around in your church today, two thirds of those who are sitting amongst us have already left in their hearts. Ouch. And you think, hang on, this is America. I'll continue. If the church is hemorrhaging young people, we have to ask ourselves if it's because we address the issue of discipleship too late. Wow. Is the spiritual education we provide for our young people neither consistent enough nor rigorous enough to provide them with the means to have a strong and stable faith in a time when there are many challenges to the authenticity and relevance of their beliefs? You get the idea. This is a great book, Sticky Faith. Anyone read it? I've run a whole weekend training workshop just on this concept of Sticky Faith. Faith trajectories are often set in early adolescence. Sadly, most youth ministries are long on fun and fluff and short on listening and thoughtful engagement. The former produces a million paper boats and the latter produces a handful of seaworthy ships. I'd like to continue. As I said, I've only got a couple more quotes. Hang on, this isn't clicking over. There we go. This is an Australian. Philip Hughes, the Christian researcher researcher here in Australia. This is from the the, um, statistics. 50,000 young people a year are leaving the Christian faith and deciding that they have no religion. Have you guys heard uh, Mark McCrindle, the Christian sort of, you know, demographer and, you know, statistician and whatever? We had him speak at Greater Sydney for our think tank to all of the representatives from all Adventist churches. There's about 500 people in the room who were the key people that boards had decided to be there to hear this message. And he, he, he hit this very hard. He said, the growing trend at the moment is not, I'm going to jump from this faith to this faith. It's, 
No faith. No religion. That's the growing trend at the moment. So not just like, I'm not happy with how it's happening, yeah, I'm going to try this. It's just, I'm done. So that's a challenging statistic for us. David Goodwin, also an Australian, one of the biggest problems I have seen, and I'm, I believe, um, um, which I believe must be addressed, is that a large percentage of children who have been brought up in Sunday schools and churches and in Christian homes do not continue on into adult church. So the thing I'm saying is, how do we shape lifelong faith? And I believe it's that partnership between home, church, and school. We've got to do that better. Josh McDowell, change and the church. 20 years ago, the phrase was, I don't, if you don't reach a young person by 18, you probably won't reach them. Now, atheists and agnostics have the same access to your kids as we do. It's just one click away. The internet has leveled the playing field. And now, if you don't reach a child by their 12th birthday, you won't reach them. So again, in children's ministries, I'm like, ooh, so much to do. And then we've got Barry Gain. You're familiar with Value Genesis 1 and 2, the two studies within the church? It is an increasingly, there's, there is an increasing probability that young people will develop high Christian commitment and high loyalty to the church if they have the benefits of effective homes, effective churches, and effective Adventist schools. Exactly where it is that we're starting to track towards in this conversation. I couldn't agree more. All right. There are other communities of faith that are grappling with the same challenges that we face. How many of you have heard of the Year to Stay initiative? Yep. So there's some guys from a number of Christian organizations that are going, you know what? We lose a lot of young people and we can't just go, oh, it's when they get older and they're teens, it's just normal. He's going, no, something's changing. And he goes, it's naive and, and arrogant of us to go, we do a great job when they're younger but when they become teens, the guys that look after them as teens do a bad job and the wheels fall off. He's going, we're actually not doing a, bad, a good enough job when they're children so that they stay on as lifelong disciples. He goes, we, we can't just blame the youth and young adult ministries. He goes, we need to actually think about what we do in the much younger years. And I think it's really true. So a number of faith organizations started this year to say, yet to stay conversation looking at 10 key faith pillars. We as a church responded, and all of the children's ministries directors around Australia got together, including myself and many others, and we looked at what does that look like in the Adventist context, and we came up with Faith Shaper, our response or our sort of part of the conversation, and Terry, Terry Williams from Yet to Stay came and shared with us in Sydney as presented in a number of places, and he actually starts to talk about some of the things we're talking about that came out of Faith Shaper. And what did we do? We condensed these down to seven. How many of you have seen this before? Yep. So the shaping acronym. These are the things that are important for kids to be a part of in their faith development from very young. From very young. S stands for service and mission. H in the shaping acronym is homes empowered. So how do we empower homes and parents to do all that they can? to grow their kids as disciples. Authentic relationships, this idea of people at church going, I don't have kids, but you could really be a part of demonstrating authentic relationships to the kids in your church. Who are significant mentors and adults in the church that can actually invest in kids and not just investing in our own kids? Participation, how do churches say, you are a member, a valuable part of our church, how do our kids get involved in doing church and being church? How are they involved? Yeah, I want to pause. It breaks my heart, breaks my heart, the number of churches that you go to and kids do not have a voice or have any say or are not a part of anything to do with church. What warmed my heart today is to see how kids were embraced, celebrated and involved in what happens here. I want to affirm you as a church and I want to say something to you. It's rare. It's very rare. And you think to me, surely it can't be that bad. I get around a lot of churches. There are 95 churches in Sydney. We try to get around all of them at some point in time, and it breaks my heart that it's rare. And I'm hearing amens here because there's people that I know from Sydney that could testify to the fact that what you have here is rare. Please continue to make that a priority. I beg you and I plead you because it's for the kingdom. It's for the kingdom. 
So what you are doing and how you're involving kids here is absolutely critical to shaping lifelong faith. Because kids, if they are made to feel like you just do your thing and stay quiet and whatever, and then when you're old enough, we'll take you seriously, some of those statistics come back to haunt us. I don't feel like this is my church. My gifts and my whatever have never been inquired about or, in, or enhanced or, or grown or mentored. You know, so then we go, well, who's going to take over this ministry? Well, have we actually mentored and encouraged some people, young people, to be ready for those key roles in the future? And then we scratch our heads and go, who's going to do this? Who, you know, who's trained? Who's ready? Intergenerational connections. <sighs> I don't want to talk for too long on this. I get phone calls regularly from churches going, um, you know what? We really struggle with the noise levels at church. And so we, and you know, we, we're trying to reach, the, they make it sound really holy. We're trying to reach the community and they come in and, and it's true. They're not used to sitting quietly for so long, so they make noise. And it's true. Kids from the community sitting for half an hour listening to someone talk is like boring because they're used to TV and many other things. So they struggle. Now, like the easiest thing for us to do is just shove all the kids in the hall and have some adults look after them and do church separately to adults. And I pull my hair out and I go, please don't do it. Don't do it. Two things happen. The kids become completely disconnected from the older members of the church. And you know what the other problem is? They never want to come back in. Oh, that's way too much fun. Why would I want to come sit here? Yeah, this is boring. And I go, you've just created the biggest headache and problem for yourselves ever. Please, just think about how you can do church and life together. The kids learning from older ones, and the older ones celebrating and enjoying the energy and the creativity of the younger ones. It's awesome. And statistics prove this time and time again. When they lose the connection with the older generation, you lose them. If they know older people care about them and value them, and may not necessarily agree on style and all this stuff, but are still there and supportive, you've got them. But if they feel like, no, you guys need to, that's it. I say to them, there are so many other things that you can do. We've developed welcome packs that I demonstrate to churches. I'm like, let the kids be part of worship, and this is just one idea that I'm sharing as part of the presentation. Let the kids enjoy all the prelims, the songs, the testimonies, the mission, the everything, and when they struggle to sit and listen for half an hour, give them an activity pack that's age appropriate, and, allow, and we have young people in my church that are about 12 to 14 responsible for handing those out at that point in the program because the moment they get it and they run in, they disengage from all the bits they would enjoy, do all the activities, and by the time the sermon comes, they're bored out of their brain and you still have the same problem. So we're like, I've often tried to make sure that my sermon outlines like, and you did such a great job, Denise, those activity sheets tie in with the theme for the day. The kids are doing something, but they're engaged. Brilliant. Hard work takes time, but brilliant. Kids have something to do, but they're part of what's going on. And parents are like, oh, thank you. You're such a blessing. And we say, all we need you to do, we want to help you as a parent. You help us. Make sure the packs come together, the crayons go back in, or the pencils. All the activities are not left all over the floor. And we'll take all the stuff out and repack it for next week. Have it in a tub ready to give to your child. We have their names on it so they feel like they own it. And we have heaps of guest ones for kids that are that are visiting for the first time. Great initiative, but don't just shove them in the hall and go, well, that's how we're gonna solve the noise problem. Intergenerational worship, absolutely critical. Noteworthy memory events, summer camps, wow weeks at school, adventure, pathfinder initiatives, you name it. All of those big memory events are really important because as they struggle in faith later on in their life, they look back at those moments and go, man, that was fun. I made some big decisions at that camp. I really enjoyed the speaker at this one. Those noteworthy memory events are life shapers. Last one, God encounters. How do we encourage them to encounter and communicate and share and hear from God for themselves and not just presume that we're gonna do it for them? Teaching them how to pray. What is prayer? How does it work? How do you have your own God moment? Not just me doing it for you. So we've put that there for a few reasons. The acronym shaping to try and make it simple and easy to remember, but I must say this to you, and I'll say it publicly, and I'll say it to the rest of my team. The one that we weakened, in my opinion, from here to stay is 10, is the rites of passage. We don't have anywhere to put that neatly. Young people today don't know when they've actually become a man or a woman. 
Rites of passage, how we celebrate the transitions from different moments in their life is a missed opportunity for us as a church to affirm them and encourage them and shape them and guide them. There's some cultures that do this well, we don't. And here to stay have thrown it out there as a very important one and I think we weakened it with ours, I'm just being honest. So our one is nice and neat and easy to remember but it doesn't fit as neatly or as specifically or as separately as the year to stay conversation. So this is the feedback I gave them. I said, I don't like that. I think that's weak, but you're one voice of many. But I, I think it's still important to talk about. Sorry? Sharping. Instead of shaping, sharping. Put the R in. Sharping. Weapons of mass destruction. I don't know. All right. Um, Anyway, I I just wanted to throw that out there as a side note. Another very important part of this collaboration conversation, and I want to share this with you because it's a church context, not a school, but I think there's collaboration between the two. One of the most popular workshops I'm doing in Sydney at the moment is around five ways that you can make focusing on kids at your church the greatest evangelistic opportunity ever, in my opinion. Okay? And watch me just very carefully. One thing you do every week, every week, is kids' Sabbath school, right? What a great opportunity for families that are looking for something for their kids to do, to throw that out there as an evangelistic opportunity, not just looking after our own kids and educating them, but something that we can invite people from the outside into. What a great opportunity. I talk to so many people from other faiths. You know what, they, what blows their mind? Is our curriculums. It's consistent all around the world. They just go, what, are you kidding me? Yes, what we're studying here, what they're studying there, and what they're studying there, it's all the same. There's one for teachers to try and make their life easier. The churches that say to me, oh, we don't like that curriculum, we're gonna do our own. I go, well, tell me how that works for you. You've gotta figure out what you're gonna teach on the weekend, how you're gonna teach it. Then, let alone, what are you gonna send home with the parents to help them equip You're going to equip the parents with to give them something to do with their kids when they get home. The job becomes really complex. Becomes huge. What a great opportunity to go, here's a curriculum that you can do that gives you some guidance. Now it's not set in stone. It's a guide. Make it your own. Make it as colorful and creative as you want, but it's there to make your job easier. And it's there so that you can give it to parents and say, when you go home, make sure you take a moment to talk to your kids about this. So I want to tell you, your kids' time here at church is a great opportunity to invite people into that. Um, I'll skip past this. And it's also a fun, creative time. I love this. Tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I'll understand. Sabbath school is great. It's an active learning process and I, I talk about the total hour. It's not just one person getting in there and picking it up just before they run in the room and reading it to the kids and boring them out of their brain. It's a fun, creative, hour-long learning um, um, environment. And those are just a few things. I do a whole separate workshop on Gracelink and some of the other um, uh, resources that exist. Church time. So we talk about Sabbath school, church time. You guys did an incredible job today with involving and, and doing something creative for kids. Families are desperate for those sort of moments. How many of you are familiar with Messy Church? Excellent. What I loved is adults and kids were doing church together today, and it was fun and creative. Messy church is a similar thing. It's not drop your kids off, we'll look after them for an hour or two, and mum and dad enjoy Gloria Jeans, we'll see you later. It's let's do this together. And it's great for families that are not familiar with church. So mum and dad from the community struggle to sit and listen to a sermon for half an hour. But if they're doing something with their kids for an hour where they're going to all these different stations, music and craft and stories and you see it there, food and whatever, and you go, we're gonna do this as adults and kids all together and it's called Messy Church because guess what? It's messy, but it's fun. And it's mums and dads who are desperate to do things with their kids, they do it together because nowadays families don't do an awful lot together. We'll talk about that too. Does your church run a play group? Excellent. Man, this church just tick, 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 great. Play groups are an awesome opportunity to engage with your broader community. One that I just want to highlight, have you heard of me, um, help, um, Happy Hands? Have you heard of Happy Hands? 
It's an Adventist lady from Melbourne that started this. You register with her, you get everything you need for, the, for, the, for each session, for the term. They go on a website, they do all of your admin, registration, everything, parents pay for it. I challenge you, go and do your homework. Go and look up Happy Hands and see how many places are registered. 95% of them are Adventist schools or churches, and guess what? Every one of them, bar a few that might be new, are sold out. Sold out. Parents go, oh, I can go to that. And you're not sitting there going, oh, how many kids are coming? What do we do? What's the program? What's the curriculum? What are the resources? They do everything. And the parents pay the fee for each session that covers the cost of that. So it doesn't actually cost churches anything. There's about, Sydney was not doing this at all. At the moment, we've got about six or seven churches that are doing um, happy hands because it started as an as a initiative in Melbourne. The lady is now winning awards. The, the, the community and councils in Melbourne are recognizing this going, this is great. The church is leading the way in that. And I think, wow, let's get the message out. So happy hands. Whoa, let me continue. Another great opportunity for evangelism. How many of you are involved in Adventurers of Pathfinders? Can I tell you that in Sydney, most of the big clubs are 60% non-Adventist. Do you know that? 60% non-Adventist in the club. I can speak from experience. Um, a number of the clubs that are closest to where I live and work have a massive non-Adventist um, contingent. And you know why that's happening? Our kids. They're at school. They're our greatest evangelists. Oh, man, we went on the best camp ever. What camp? I've never been. What's camping? Oh, we put up a tent. We made a fire. The boys, what? You, you were allowed to make a fire? I don't know how to make a fire. I've never slept, I've never slept in a tent. It, it ripped my heart out. I went on a year seven camp. Two boys standing with a tent, looking at it. What do we do with this? Um, you sleep in it. Looks a bit small. Or you've got to set it up. How do you do that? I said, and I, I, I thought they were joking at first. Like I said, come on, guys. If you need help, let me know. He got, and the boy looked at me, legit in the eyes. And I could tell he wasn't lying. He goes, Pastor Craig, I've never set up a tent. I thought, I, I, had, to, I had a lump in my throat. I, I wanted to cry in front of him. And I said to him, seriously, mate. He goes, I've never been camping with my mom or my dad. They work their guts out. They have everything they want or need in Sydney. But man, they don't have moments to go camping with their kids. What an opportunity. And our kids are our biggest advocates. My church, Marlin Community Church, we, we have a, we've been running for two years. Our Pathfinder Club now has 45 kids in it. 45 kids. And about a third of those come from the community and from the surrounding area because they go to school with their friends and their friends go, you need to come join us. This is so much fun. Evangelistic opportunity, focusing on kids, but not just our own, entertaining our own, but inviting others to be a part of that. Um, and now I wanna start talking about broader community events. Our church is doing what we call the Family Fun Day, where we run just normal backyard fun games and we invite the whole community, pathfinders, adventurers, we letterboxed everyone in the street around us, told them that it was on. We ran a barn night as a follow-up from that. We had 20 people walk across the road that had never laid foot in our church to come along to those two events. What a great opportunity. And they came with their kids and they had fun. It was focused on kids, but you focus on kids and you get the, the families or the parents. One idea I want to throw out for you as a church... Um, Hang on, there we go. One of the things that we've developed at, at my local church is this little um, concertina sort of little um, flyer. And it all folds down into just that one, one rectangle, almost looks like a business card. But every single thing on it talks about a ministry and most of them are children's related. People carry this in their handbags and their wallets and whatever. And when they're talking to friends at work or at, you know, at school, they give them one of these and say, hey, if you're looking for things to do with your kids, these are some of the things that we offer. I think it's a really simple but a really great way for us to start thinking of the message of what we can do for other people's kids in our space. Very simple thing to do, but man, has it been effective. 
And many churches are asking us if we can now send them a sample of that digitally so they can tailor make it and put their own information into it. And I think that's a great idea. And we've been using that with our uh, Operation Winter Warmers, which is where we collect tin food, non-perishable food and blankets in the area. When we at people's doors saying, and we letterbox them two weeks before, when we come to collect it, they're often ready with a bag. Oh, he has the blanket, he has the food. We have those and we say, hey, there's other things that we do as a church. If you're interested, he has one. Most people will take it because they've interacted with you on being involved with collecting the food or blankets. And yet we're getting a little bit of information out there on other things that we're able to offer. How many of you have ever been involved in a, I hate using this word because in Australia everyone's like, what? Um, you've done a VBS, which is a kids, like a kid, holiday kids club. VBS means vacation Bible school. Who uses that anymore? I mean the word. You say that to the community, come along to our vacation Bible school, and you'll see them go, no thanks. You say to them, come along to the school, you know, a kids holiday school program. Oh yeah, awesome, we're looking for something for the kids to do. Don't use VBS if you're doing it in the community, just seriously, it doesn't work. Your flyers, throw them in the bin. So we've gone through this process. We've gone through this process of establishing a whole series of um, tins that we don't buy, that we encourage the churches not to buy, but the conference buys them and then lends them to churches because it costs a lot of money. You do one kit, use the theme for the year, and then you're like, well, we can't do it next year because what's going to happen? The kids will be like, uh, hello, been there, done that, have the T-shirt, did this last year, so you need to do a new one. But that costs money again. But if we have a library of kits that you can borrow, you go, okay, we want to do this one this year. Look at all the resources, look at all the ideas, put the program together, give the conference the tin back, and we buy the next one, and it becomes a lending library. So that's what we've done. We've developed um, a massive list of resources, as you can see there. And I haven't, out of courtesy, I haven't put all the churches that have ones out that they're borrowing at the moment. But it's a great, great thing. I often have a headache of ringing them and saying, I need it back. Another church is waiting on it. They want it. How long do you still need it? But um, a great initiative. And I would encourage you, the school holidays is an opportunity where families are pulling their hair out, going, what are we going to do with the kids? If you have any capacity or opportunity to do it, not only for your own kids, but kids in the community, I would encourage you to think of that as well. These are some of the themes, fun, creative. Um, these are just the ones from group. There are many other um, sort of uh, themes and stuff as well. And I'll continue to move on because I've got just a few more things to share with you. Those are just a few of the resources and one of the trainings that I did just for one church. One church in Sydney was so keen to do this. Um, it was Sydney Chinese, actually. They'd never done a VBS and never done one to reach outside of the Chinese community in where they were situated. And I said, well, maybe try the VBS approach. And they've just picked it up and they're going for gold. So that was a training just for their church. So I've talked about five initiatives. Children's Sabbath School, Kids Church, Playgroups, Adventurers and Pathfinders, and Community Events or Kids Holiday Clubs. I'm nearly done. You know how I said to you that whole homegrown idea of these are the stats, these are the challenges, whatever. I didn't want to just leave you with the bleak news. This is what I want to challenge you with today, as a parent or as a children's ministries leader. I say to people, what is one next step that you can commit to taking as you leave here today? Don't become overwhelmed with, oh, you know, we feel guilty. We should be doing so much more. And it's like a New Year's resolution. You know how you come up with seven and you keep none of them? So pick one. Say one thing that we're going to do. And when that becomes part of us and what we do, and we do it regularly, it's now part of our DNA, you can think about doing others. Here's some ideas. Eating at least one meal as a family each week without distractions. Parents talking or praying with child as they drop them off at school or listening to scripture on some of the, um, you know, Pastor JP was telling me that he, he li often listens to scripture with those audio things in the car as he's traveling with the kids. Great idea. Parents praying on the driveway to be an effective husband or wife, father or mother before entering the house. Developing a particular heart building habit personally or as a home using various resources for creative home worship time at least once in the week. Don't, don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't go, we'll do it every day and you're not doing it at all and then feeling really bad that it just can't happen. Do one day. Cutting back on screen time to create more together fun family time. 
using a marriage resource to take a next step in the quality of your marriage, having a study or prayer journal personally or as a home, committing to reading your children's Sabbath school lesson with them at least once during the week. I find I go there and I talk to kids and they all look at you like they don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, parents, just once, just say, hey, do you know on the weekend we're going to be talking about this? And they walk in and they engage because they're familiar, they know what's coming. So what I want to say to you is homegrown, partnering with parents or with homes in this journey is as simple as deciding on one next step and then actually taking that step and being committed to it. Not becoming overwhelmed with it and not trying too much and not making it realistic, but just one next step. On that eating at least one family meal, we're developing these placemats that you can download as PDFs and laminate and put on the table and it prompts conversations with the family and the kids around the table. And so these are mats that we're busy working on now. It's got questions, uh, high-low game, what's your highs from the day, lows for the game. It's got a few other things, verses. Family can commit a verse on that blank area that they would like to memorize. Let's talk, let's play. And then this right-hand side, parents are like, can you lose that? Because that's accountability on how many times do we have family meal together? Cross it off. Imagine flipping that over and going, this is the first one for the last three months. Excellent. So here we go. Yes, some other ideas or just projects that I'd like to throw out that we're working on and I'd like to encourage you to think or, or follow. Um, we're sending um, letters to every board in Sydney with that Faith Shaper resource to say, how are you as a church going to engage with this conversation and come at it as a church, as a whole church? Um, we're establishing lending libraries of resources for parents um, in their marriage or parenting in both local churches, key, key local churches in the various regions, and also in schools. We are saying to parents, if you'd like to know more about faith or worship or family worship or a marriage resource, he has the top 12 books that we've supplied to your local school library, and you as a parent can go and borrow that book. So that's another initiative that we're driving um, out of that. Lunchbox cards, I'll show you that in a minute. Activity packs, I talked about. Instagram ideas, I'll show you something we just launched. We're doing a revamped um, website because my website for Children's Ministries in Sydney is shocking. Please don't look at it. I hate it. And I keep saying, guys, we've got we've to work on this. And they're like, there's all these other departments. I'm like, yeah, but children, hello, most important thing ever. So we're working on that. Um, family storm code trip. I'm, I have many young people saying to me, you know, we wait until kids are 15 and 16 and go on a mission trip, and then they go by themselves. And I said to them, imagine if you say to parents, we're going to go on a family storm code trip. You're responsible for your own kids. So none of this, you know, wait until you're 15, 16 and go with the leaders by themselves. The mums and dads go with their kids and they do service together. And so I have families that are desperate for that now. So I've got a lot of homework to do on organizing family trips where parents and kids can serve together. So that's another idea I wanted to throw out. This is not coming up well, but we're developing these cards to put in lunch boxes, and on the back are just very faint lines, so you can write a message of encouragement. We're hoping that out of the 52, about half of them will be Bible verses or statements or quotes, and also some special events like happy birthday, you know, mum loves you, hint, hint, it's Mother's Day, I look forward to my present, and all that sort of stuff. So um, there we go. Um, another one, Instagram. I just launched this um, at the, in November last year at our Adventurous Camporee. If you'd like to follow me, I'm running an Instagram thing called The Brick Corner AU. If you enjoyed what we did with the Lego today, I've just started posting ideas that parents can, can use Lego with their kids in faith development and conversations and activities. So if you look at it, I have 17 followers because it's brand new. If each of you log on, I can go home and go, yes, doubled it. But if you don't, it's fine. Um, I'll never come back again. And I'm kidding. And um, it's just an idea to prompt parents on, because some parents are like, don't like Lego, don't know how it works, I'm not creative, what do I do with it? So this is just some ideas on what you can do in using Lego and faith. And it's called the Brick Corner AU. I tried just the Brick Corner, but it was already taken. And I, in faith, I said, let's go AU, because one day this will be so huge, it'll go all around the world, and then you'll have brick, the Brick Corner USA and the Brick Corner SA for South Africa. Is there any AMNs in the house? Thank you, Duncan. Excellent. And um, anyway, so, and it's based on this, building Christian faith creatively together in various corners of the community, those four C words there. 
It's Christian. It's about faith, creativity, corners as in it could be in a school or a home or a church or a whatever, whatever little corner you can find, but it's about how to engage the broader community in faith. So these are the, the ideas or the initiatives involved. That's what it looks like. Um, the little Instagram thing, it gives you um, a, a picture and when you highlight it, it gives you a little bit of a theme, uh, you know, show and tell or a verse or a prayer that you can pray or something to do together. Last but not least, people often ask me what's some of the, your favorite apps that you like to use and many people, you know, are already familiar with it, but if you're not, many people think it's just the ladies that are on Pinterest. I'm on Pinterest all the time. I'm like, hey, I want to decorate this, or I want to do this, I want to play this game with a twist. Pinterest, awesome for ideas. So if you're struggling around this area of family worship, Pinterest, and say, what are other families doing? What's fun and creative? Just take that step and do something. All right, and last but not least, one thing I want to encourage you with as a conference and as a church, you're a fairly large church, when you develop great quality things for kids, hang on to them, share them. North New South Wales do an awesome job at this. The backdrop at BAC that JP and Pastor Annalise used this week was from them. How great would it be if we replicate that all over different parts of Australia? And I said to Sydney, people, this is a no-brainer. We're one city. Greater Sydney is its own conference. We don't have to travel from one end of a state to the other to get something. If there's anyone who should do this well, it's us. I would encourage you to start to talk as a church about this or the conference about this. When you start to focus on kids and do creative stuff, hang on to it and make it available to others. Otherwise, we sort of reinvent the wheel. Churches are able to develop things, add things to the library. Schools are able to do that, add it to the library. And we're all able to use it because then something happens. You finish a, a creative program and the church often says to me, we have nowhere to store this. Or they go, um, so we're going to throw it. And I go, I, I nearly weep every time I hear that. Or we really struggle with a place to store it, but we found a place. And then you go and have a look at it, and they go, oh, yeah, we've got a backdrop on that. And you look, and it's been crammed in somewhere, and they pull it out, and you're like, oh, I can't use that. It's, it's wrecked. It's ruined. It was stored badly. So what a great way to benefit them by saying, we'll take it off your hands, and we'll store it well. And if you need it, come and get it from us, by all means. But if others need it, can they borrow it and use that as well? So a really great way for us to start thinking about how we do children's ministries more creatively, more effectively, more collaboratively together, and I think we'll really be able to do something significant. So that's one thing that we've developed in Sydney out of my passion from what I saw in North New South Wales, and our resource centre is called Props and Drops. So props and backdrops, and uh, we're looking forward to building that up, and hopefully JP will borrow something from me even further down the road than Newcastle in the future. Look, guys, I think you've heard enough from me. I'm even bored of hearing my own voice right now as well. So I just want to thank you. Hopefully some of that hit the mark. Um, I'm just going to stop right now and um, breathe and uh, pray for you, but also ask if there are any other little questions just quickly, and then we'll all just relax. Yes. Okay, I'll give you an example. At our local church, one of the things that we've... I said, okay, we've got to put you know, this into practice. We can't just talk about it. So when they transition from one Sabbath school class to another, we bring them up the front and we have a graduation ceremony with them at church with the whole congregation. We say to them, you are now going from this Sabbath school to this Sabbath school. We get both teachers up. One's, one's saying, well done, and now you're going to this one, and they receive them. We do a lot of fanfare and we clap and we give them gifts and we say, we'd like to re resource you with this, but we'd also like to give this gift to mom and dad so they can help grow you at home with this resource. Um, other things are, um, you know, like birthdays, like as they go up in particular years when they're doing the transition from primary to high school, for example, we get them up the front. This year, we, for the first time in my local church, we had two year 11s. Um, come up because we regard year 11 and 12 as the two big senior years. So we had them come up with their parents and we prayed over them as a church. So there are some, and when the, one of the young guys got his license, we made a bit of a joke out of it. We said the parents need all the prayer in the world now because their insurance premiums have gone up. 
um, you know, come up the front, but you're now taking one of those big steps in your transition. Um, so any opportunity that you can find to just affirm those key steps in their, in their journey across the different age groups, across the range. I don't know if that's helpful or that, yeah. Yes. So we do this at both school and also at church. If they respond and make a decision, there's absolutely no reason that you can't affirm and make that a really big thing if it's not necessarily that they're getting baptized, but they've made a decision. And those are all things they'll tuck away and be reminded of. And we've told to, we t I told the kids this week, hang on to those gems and those verses, because you'll look back at them later on and go, these are decisions and choices and your little commitment cards that you'll look back on and, rem and be reminded of those things. So um, when we do that at church, we make a significant call or commitment. We have certificates. I'm very blessed in my church. I have two people that are top, top, top graphic designers. And I say to them, I say, guys, this is the dream. This is the plan. This is what we'd like to do. And we throw it to them. And they feel like that they're using their gifts to be a blessing to the church by using that. We've even developed our own certificates for adventurers for kids that don't go through all the honors and the badges. But at the end of the year, we give them, we've developed our own badge as well. So if they're from the community and they, don't, they miss out and they don't do all the book work, we still want to be able to say to them, you made a decision and commitment this year. Here's your certificate. Here's your badge so they don't feel like they miss out. But um, there's, the possibilities are endless, really. Yeah. And they don't always have to look brilliant. Um, you know, like certificates don't have to be like, oh my goodness, it looks like this went through three rounds of, you know, professional design and development. We're just blessed that we've got guys that I can often flick that to. I like doing it a lot myself too. I like, I like the creative part of that. And often the, the job is for me to say, this is what I'd like on it and how I want it to look. And then they just pretty it up and do it professionally. So just jot your ideas down and but I think it's important to affirm kids when they make their decisions and not regard them as not being important at that point in time because they are making little decisions all along the way. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Maybe you disagree with something. That's cool too. I'd love that feedback so I can go, okay, how can I, how can I think about that more? How can I process that more? How can I come back at that better next time? Anyone? Please don't be shy. No one wants to st stand up and go, heresy. Oh, no. Okay. With us, um, how do you reach those families that don't come back to you? Do you have any tips? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was going to say that, I was actually going to make that joke and say, am I preaching to the choir? Yeah. It's like most people that come to workshops are like, yes. <laughs> I agree, amen. And you're like, yeah, but you know. Where are the other people that probably need to hear this? You probably are doing these things already. The important thing is for us is to model that to other families, I think. But also think as a church, how can we resource them maybe just with one thing that we're not now to make their jobs easier or encourage them to do something they're not? Like those next steps, what's one thing we as a church could say, we're gonna invest in this and put this in people's hands? And you can only invite them, you can't force them. That's what I found. And sometimes it's starting with a few people that are passionate about it and then getting them to share their testimony about it. That's powerful. Um, you know what? We got this resource and we decided to do this, read this together before we left the house. And is it, you know, it was so hard to do. People love to hear that. We never did family worships before we all ran out of the house. But we got this resource and we did it once a week and this is what's happened for us. When people hear that, they go, I think I can do that. And I can see that it was important and awesome for them. So maybe we can do that. And instead of it making it sound so hard and so complex and so overwhelming, that's why I say the next step just needs to be one thing that you can do. And not like we're gonna do family worship every day before we leave. It's just not practical. In some homes, I'm being honest. So let's do it once. And let's choose as a family when it works for all of us. But then what I love to do is to get people to talk about that and share that with the church, you know, as a testimony. And so as a family, we did this. And yes, it was hard in the beginning, but man, we're loving it. And we're up to this part of it, and this is the resource, and parents are all like, oh, excellent, that looks good. I don't know, it's just an idea. Yeah. But I know, that's the problem. Every time I do this, it's like, you look and you can see everyone like, yeah, 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 and I'm like, I'm preaching to the choir. Where are the other people that don't get it and don't come? It's tough, it's hard. Oh. 
Why are you looking at each other going, no, you go. No, you go. You, you. She speaks English. That's right. <laughs> you speak English. Don't be like that. Okay. Yes. Yes. I noticed, I noticed a bit of looking at each other when I brought that up. I'm like, uh-oh, note to self, never invited back here again. No, no, we love bracelets, but it, first of all, it's hard to implement. Like, there's a lot of tweaking. And then when you have three or four different areas, they're all doing different stories, different memory verses. Parents aren't doing worships during the it would be so much easier if our church embraced a, a common story with one... I agree. So but let me tell you something, and none, none of you would have seen this. The, 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 G, the GC is working on a new challenge curriculum. Yeah, we have heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> and this is recording, so I'm like... Let me stop you there. <laughs> I tell you what, we just had the AUC, all the directors from around Australia sat down and went through that stuff. It's not age appropriate. Oh, that's the I'll tell you right now, we're looking at this going, this is not developed by people that are in the trenches doing it. So it's actually worse than what we have now. But I challenge you to look at other resources. I, I can't believe I just said that out loud. And this is being recorded. Okay, thanks Bryce. You just gave me the thumbs up, turn it into this, because I'm down. No, I'm kidding. We gave, the, we gave the feedback to the division. We said, we are going to write a letter saying, we don't think that this is hitting the mark. Well, we don't use Grace Link for a few bad reasons here. Yep. Because it is so hard and people weren't doing Let me ask you this question. Do you find it easier to do your own? Yes. Or is it more work? Oh, we get... The results are better? Yeah, and that is, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've heard all of those. Yeah, I agree with you. It's a lot easier to adopt a different curriculum that was putting that bit of flavour on. Okay. And, and still had to chop it up to fit in our, our segment. And it took a long time, but the result was better. I get that. And look, there's a lot of big churches in Sydney that, I'll be honest with you, do exactly the same thing. I'm going to throw it out there. My personal opinion, and I, I wrote a letter to one of the churches that hit this really strong, and they were really aggro and vocal about it. Um, and I, I simply said this. I said, I get that it's a lot of work. I said, but there's something to be said about someone coming and engaging with me at my local church, and then through school engaging with another church, and we're all on the same page. And that I have, have you guys been able to go the next step in, and yes, all the stuff we would like to give to parents to follow up with them during the week? Because I tell you what, that's a massive job too. So I've said to people, I get that there's weaknesses and I agree with many of them. But I also think there's some massive pluses and gains that we should not disregard in the process. Um, if a family's engaging with, and I, do, I did this as a chaplain, brand new family figuring out Adventist, their interactions with us, you know, both at socials and school events, they're like, oh, these people are okay. They don't have two heads and they're not weird come along to church, to this event, maybe a social event. And as they interact with different churches, my job as a chaplain was to say, you know what, there's not one church that may be um, where you belong. You might want to go and visit this church and this church, and this is the pastor, and this, is the, this chaplain goes to this church, and this guy's from this church, and introduce them to that. And as they do that, and they realize that there's some consistency, and there's something that we're all doing, and we're all on the same page, and as I said to you, guys from other churches that I talk to in children's ministries are blown away by the fact that the whole world church has this in all these. I show them the app often where you can look at every age group. Have you guys used the app at all? And also some of the video clips that come with the, age, the younger age groups, like they develop little, power, um, little video clips and felt boards, digital felt boards. I show them that and I go, this is developed and shared all around the world and we're all on the same page. That is a strength. I'm not saying it's ideal because it has a very strong flavor of where it's developed that doesn't always translate into every situation. And I feel, and I'm going to say this again, and I'm, I'm just joking before because I've told the division and this, I'm happy to tell the GC, I don't feel that what comes next is really, it's going to be worse than what we have now. 
seriously. Oh, what a, you'd make a great politician. We're happy to support you. <laughs> so we do several different yeah. Things. One or two uh, divisions do Grace We do Orange. We make our own thing. Awesome. It would be great, actually, if we had one unified system that we are really, that is useful. Yeah. And it is kind of going with the same stories, memory verses from the youngest till teen. Yeah. So one family can sit together down, do the same story. And apply it to different... I, I agree with you. Yeah. Look, and the reason I, I threw that out there is I'm trying to present the same message to every church that I talk to. Some churches that do this by themselves, I must confess, do it really well. So my point is not feeling forced to go a particular way that doesn't work in your context. I think the message I'd like Springwood to hear is whatever you do in your children's Sabbath school at that time think outside of your own community and do it really well and engage with the broader community in what you think is best for you. No one, I can't determine that for you as a church. I can't say no Grace Link's better for Springwood. I think there's some benefits and my message is consistent across Sydney because I also don't think I can walk across and say, look, you guys should do Grace Link. Oh, no, it's okay if you guys, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's the message we need to... Maybe I need to just do that so that one day I will be invited back to Springwood and you'll be like, we still love and care for you, and that's great. Yep. 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 Look, again, I want to hold up our schools as the perfect place to have some of those conversations. Um, recently, at uh, the school I was last involved with as a full-time chaplain, we talked about some of those tough topics with the kids. Because in that chapel, you've got kids from Buddhist, Muslim, um, in Sydney, there's a massive Sikh and, and Indian um, um, population as well. In fact, very close to Mountain View School where I was working at. Um, that's a massive, massive center for them. And you have to respectfully share what you think to be true, but in a way that you think will reach all of those different people. But we were able to say, this is what we believe, this is why we believe it, we love, we care about you, we're happy to have you here. But we were able to hit some really big topics with them, and it's interesting to hear the feedback and the comments that come from not only our own kids and other Christian kids, but kids from other faiths as well. So I think our schools are probably, I think, most ideally placed to have some of those conversations, but that said and done, I don't think we talk about it enough as a church. Um, I think to be able to say to young people, you know, this whole issue of, um, you know, like in the in Sydney had a massive focus on this plebiscite with around you know leading up to the to the vote on on homosexuality, and it gave us the opportunity to talk about some really direct things with young people. And they, some of them were, you know, like we're actually really angry at the church that they're not more proactive in what's happening. But then for us to be able to balance that and say, well, you know what? There's one thing to love people exactly for who they are but also fundamentally disagree with, with where they're coming from. So... It was a big one for us. It was massive. It was, it was huge. Yeah. So I think we need to be upfront with young people and say these are some of the things that we grapple with. And as Christians, how do we interact and how do we have conversations with people that we fundamentally disagree with or come at you know, life in a, in, or see life in a different way? Or agree with, exactly, yeah. All right, anyone else? Everyone's like, okay, please finish and sit down so that we can. All good?